Hey guys, welcome to an introduction to dynamic programming. Now I know that dynamic programming is a thing that a lot of beginners struggle with and that's because it's a really hard topic to initially understand and the only way to really do it is through a lot of problems. When I was a beginner and I was starting out with dynamic programming, I struggled a lot. I had to go through a lot of YouTube tutorials, a lot of blog posts and I had to solve a lot of problems to really get the hang of it. So I'm going to be teaching you about dynamic programming the way I wish I was taught. I'll be going over everything from what dynamic programming is to iterative and recursive dynamic programming to cl classical and non-classical problems on it. So let's not start with the technical side of dynamic programming and let's just look at a problem. I'll explain this problem solution and, and then we'll see how it can be generalized into a problem solving technique called dynamic programming. So the problem that we'll be looking at is called frog one. It's taken from the art coder educational dynamic programming contest. The link to this problem will be in the description below. Please go ahead and read it once on your own. To make sure we're on the same page, I'm going to go ahead and explain what the problem is asking us. So let's look at the third sample input, which is So we're told that there's a frog initially at stone one. So the frog is over here and the frog wants to reach stone N, which is the last stone. So the frog wants to reach this stone. Now the frog can jump either one stone ahead or two stones ahead. So from the first stone, the frog could either jump to the second stone or to the third stone or from any given stone, it can jump one or two stones ahead. To jump from one stone to another stone, the cost we incur or the distance it travels is the absolute difference of the heights of these stones. And the heights are given as input. So we want to find the minimum cost for the frog to jump from stone one to stone n. And initially when you read a problem like this, you might be thinking that we can just greedily go to a stone which incurs the minimum cost at that time. So for example, you might be thinking that we can go from the first stone to the second one because we have a cost of 20 versus a cost of 30 if we go to the third one. Then from the um, second stone, we could probably go to the fourth stone which has a cost of zero. And so the total cost to reach this would be 20. And from this stone, we could go to the last stone because now it has a cost of 40. And so our total cost to reach this stone through this sequence would be 60. But this is actually not the best we can do. As shown in the sample input explanation over here, the optimal path to follow is from 1 to 3 to 5 to 6, which is basically like this. Because we incur a cost of 30, 0, and then 10, which gives the total cost of 40. So we can see that a simple greedy solution does not work for this problem. We need to approach this problem in a different way. So now let's just consider this. Let's say we want to calculate the minimum cost to reach some stone. Let's just pick this stone. We know that the choices we can make it are we could either come from the last stone or we could have come from the second last stone. So let's say we had the optimal answer, the minimum cost to reach both of these two stones then we could easily calculate the minimum cost to reach this stone because it would just be the minimum of the answer for i minus 1 plus or the answer for i minus 2 sorry this should be 60 
for i minus 2 So if we knew the optimal answers for these two stones, then we could pretty easily calculate the optimal answer for this stone. And now if we know the optimal answer for this stone, then for any stone ahead of it, we could easily calculate the optimal answer. So in a sequence, we can easily calculate the answer for the nth stone by calculating the answers for all the stones before it. And this is pretty cool because initially we know that we are at stone 1 with a cost of 0. And the, really, the only way to reach the second stone is from the first stone incurring a cost of 20 because that's the difference between their values. Now, to reach the third stone, we could either come from the first stone or the second stone. And we know that we have the optimal answers to these two stones. So we can calculate the optimal answer for the third stone as well. which would basically be the minimum of 0 plus 30 or the minimum of 20 or the minimum of 20 plus 50. And we know that the minimum cost here would simply be 30. So we'll say that the answer for this is 30. Now for the fourth stone, we knew that we could either come from stone number 2 or stone number 3. So the cost for coming from stone number 2 would be the difference between their values plus 20 or we could minimize it with 50 plus 30 which is 80. So the minimum cost here would be 20. Now again what's the minimum cost for the fifth stone? It's either 30 or 50 plus 20. So we take 30. What's the minimum cost for the last stone? It's either 40 plus 20 or 10 plus 30 and the minimum cost here would be 40. So you can see that by building up our answer from smaller problems. So for example, we could just remove this whole part and if we could calculate the answer for here, then we can do it for any element after this point as well. So we broke down this problem into smaller problems which were what's the minimum cost to reach this stone? What's the minimum cost to reach this stone for every stone? And that way, our smaller problem finally merged into a larger problem, which was of reaching this last stone. And we computed the result the same way we computed the result for our smaller problems. Now, this is what dynamic programming actually is. It's this method of thinking where you say, hey, if I know the solution to a smaller problem, and I know that I can compute the answer for a bigger problem using solutions to multiple smaller problems, then I can do that for the final answer as well. So more formally, let's try to generalize what we did here. Computing the answer for some prefix or some stone can be viewed as a state. And so this state is actually what information we're trying to store. So if I had an array called dp and it was a 1d array, dp of i would simply store the minimum cost to reach stone i from stone 1, which would, and that would be our state, the minimum cost to reach stone i from stone 1. And the way to compute this state would be called a transition. So we transitioned over from dp of i minus 1 and dp of i minus 2. We knew the answer to these two states. So we were able to transition to dp of i from these two. We also have something what's called a base case, which is basically we started at stone 1. So the cost to reach stone 1 was just 0. And that's important. So we can build up our answer to the final problem using answer for smaller problems. Also, a way to think about transitions would be to think in terms of the choices we have for each state. In this problem, it was clearer to us what choices we had because it was given in the statement itself that we could arrive at stone i from stones 
I minus one or I minus two. So the choice we only had to make were which stone to come from and we tried both of them and we picked the one which gave us a lower cost. And this is how dynamic programming works. There, there are multiple ways to compute this. We could do iterative dynamic programming or recursive dynamic programming. Uh, more on that in the next video where I'll go over more technical details on dynamic programming. But from this video, you should try to understand the main idea behind dynamic programming. We'll be looking at a lot of non-classical and classical problems later, which will help you understand it because dynamic programming really can only be understood through a lot of problems. And so let's just go over the code for this problem once. All right, so we just take in our input. We declare this DP array. This is our state. What's the best answer for the prefix up to I? Now we know that our base case DP. Well, our base case is already here initialized with zero because that, um, this follows zero based indexing. So the zeroth index will have a cost of zero and we can manually set the value for DP of one because we don't want to access the net minus one index in our for loop and after that we can just use our transition function which was taking the minimum value of the last two of the cost of the last two jumps to the current stone and yeah this is it so this is what you would also call a bottom up approach in dynamic programming but yeah don't worry about that we'll go over it later so yeah i hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful Hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay notified about future uploads because I will be uploading more videos in this playlist and do leave feedback in the comments below. If you have some problems inside dynamic programming that you would like me to cover later on, please also do leave those below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.